For most of you, I think you're, you're familiar with uh, um, me and, and Coach I here, but um, I'll just reiterate, my name is Brad Connick. I'm the North Association Head Coach. Um, the role within the association, um, the first part of that is the identification and selection of coaches for each of the teams. Uh, the second part is to work with the coaches throughout the year um, in you know, mentoring them, answering questions. Um, the third part is working as a liaison for the parent. Um, any situations that arise um, where a parent uh, has concerns with the coach that they're not comfortable in, in uh, talking to the coach directly about, um, or more global issues, you know, maybe it's uh, you know, practice plans, um, you know, bench demeanor, uh, way the coach is talking to the referees, whatever it is, and they want it to maybe be on more of a confidential level. Whatever it may be, whatever a parent's concern is, they can come to me and we'll basically create a course of action. If it's specific um, to a, a, a player a coach issue, um, a lot of the times I'll get Trent involved, we'll have a meeting with the, uh, the parents, um, uh, the player and uh, myself and, and Trent. But the, the point being that uh, we're, we're uh, uh, advocate for both the parents and the coaches. <coughs> And we're, we're there to try to help, uh, you know, diffuse and address any questions or concerns that arise uh, throughout the year. Um, the, the third part of, of my role is I am the liaison between Trent and the high school program and the youth um, coaches specifically. So we coordinate uh, uh, monthly meetings as best we can where Trent comes in and, and uh, kind of gets a pulse on how everyone's season's going, uh, provides guidance to the coaches. and. Uh, support from that perspective. Um, the one uh, thing that I'm going to that, that I'll address here in this meeting before I pass it over to Trent, um, I know that uh, inevitably every year there's uh, you know question concerns about coaches, and you're going to get that no matter what. You could have you know Jock Lemire coaching the PWA team, and someone's going <coughs> to find something wrong with it. You know he's too intense. He's not intense enough. He he weighs too important when he's not important enough. He does too much skating, not enough skating, too many systems, not enough systems. I mean, they're just, there's no perfect, there's no perfect answer, but inevitably, um, there are situations um, that arise, and, and just so that everyone understands, the way that the, the coach selection process works is basically, you know, we create a pool of potential candidates. Anytime we have a non, a, 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 a legitimate non-parent option for a coach, especially at the higher levels, the, the, the double A, A, um, even you know B1 levels, um, we're going to take it. And part of the reason why I specifically mentioned those levels is that, in my experience, this is my fourth year doing it. As far as non-parent coaches contacting me, saying they're interested in coaching in LHA, unless they're you know really green and haven't coached in other associations before, if they come and are looking to volunteer and they have five. 10, 12, 15 years of coaching experience, and they're going to be a non-parent coach, inevitably, almost every single time, they want to coach AA, A, maybe B1. Okay, so generally, that's where our non-parent coaching options are. If we get them at other levels, we absolutely would take them, and I, and I try to um, encourage coaches, non-parent coaches, to take those positions, but it's a, it's a, tough, it's a tough sell. They, they have other associations that they can go to and get the, the A and AA um, team. So that's a, that's a challenge. So at that point then, once the teams are formed at the end of trials, if you think about it from a math perspective, okay, so aside from squirts where maybe there's two B teams and we can do a little bit of shuffling as far as what our coaching candidates are, we oftentimes end up, especially at the C level, with 15 players, okay, which basically means that we have 15 dads and 15 moms. From my experience, there might be one or two moms um, that play hockey, and there might be three, four, five dads that can skate. Okay, so now group, you shrink that pool down to maybe five to six to seven candidates, and many times you contact all of those candidates, and their first choice is not to be head coach. You know, they, they admittedly will say, I'm not a head coach, I don't want to be a head coach, I don't want to... I, I don't know enough about hockey, I don't have practice plans, I don't have all of these things, but push comes to shove, when we explain to them, okay, it's you or John Dover here who's never skated before, 
and just says, yeah, I'll just throw my name on, you know, shingle on the door and, and call myself a head coach, inevitably we're able to convince people and it, it's, it's um, critical to our association that these people do step up and that they are willing to take the head coach spot and the responsibility that goes with it. Um, and so I just want to make sure everyone understands that that process is, is imperfect and the, the, the nice thing is that some of these coaches that initially don't want to be head coaches step up and then hopefully with the right support and mentorship from myself, Coach Kraft, Coach Eichen, we can help them develop good practice plans, you know, teach them about, you know, the importance of, you know, the balance between winning and losing and having fun and all of that. And over the next few years, we can develop them into legitimate head coaches that have the experience now. And so I just wanted to make sure from a head coaching perspective, that's one of the things that often comes back to me is, geez, Louise, you know, it's just, it's a little embarrassing that we can't get, you know, stellar coaches at all levels, at all, you know, um, at all, on all teams. And it's just, it's not a reality. Inevitably, we're going to end up with some inexperienced coaches. And that's where as parents, if you have questions, concerns, you see something you don't like, you can come to us and we'll do our best to, to work with those coaches and, and, and help sort of coach them up in a sense. So um, with that, I'll pass it on to, to Coach Eichner and, and uh, you'll have a chat for you. All right, thanks guys um, for coming up. Uh, for my 10 cents, purpose of the meeting for me um, is this is the time of year when I've had uh, plenty of time to go through parent surveys, uh, have meetings with Crafty and, and Brad. Um, I've met with most of our, our coaches um, and, and kind of a chance to just digest everything. Um, and this is the first time I advocated uh, for having this meeting in the off season. One of the most difficult challenges for me as a coach, the head coach at, at the high school, um, in my leadership role in the youth association is actually meeting people, okay? getting face to face, okay, which is not usually the case. A lot of times parents feel like, oh, I would never go talk, talk to the high school coach. I actually would prefer to talk to everyone in the association so they have a better understanding of, of what we're trying to do in our hockey association as it pertains to the youth. Um, my role in, in terms of LHA as the high school coach um, is that of a leadership role, helping to kind of mold and direct um, and work with these guys in, in um, our philosophy as an association, as it pertains to ABC, winning, losing, all those different things. Okay? And with that being said, for you guys that don't know, you know, Brad played college hockey at Harvard, played pro hockey and Crafty played at Minnesota, played pro hockey, and I did the same. Um, so the one thing we do have is passion for the game, okay? And ultimately, um, we're put into all situations to try to advocate for every player in LHA and what's best. and make the decisions and make the teams and with that we understand that there comes you know some some darts every now and then that's just fine okay ultimately when I took over the, the hockey program at North five years ago I wanted to have a great hockey program okay and there's a number of different factors that go into that that I pay attention to okay and one of the numbers is um, it's always a, a number we put up during trials. Okay? It's a number of players that North has at any given level. So this year for Pee Wee, that number will be around 60 players. Okay? High 50s, low 60s. Okay? And if you look at the teams and the communities we compete against, Edina, Wyzetta, Minnetonka, okay? that same number will go up on their board and it'll be 211, and 224, and 217. So the point I'm trying to make is that okay, we're um, severely uh, at a disadvantage when it comes to the size of our association. Now people consider Lakeville a big city, but we're two hockey associations. Okay? So we'll take those 66 POEs and try to mentor them up and go compete against these, these teams that are going to put 224, 244 POEs out on the ice. So with that, there comes a great deal of responsibility to make sure we're doing the right things with the kids and the coaches to make sure everybody's having a good experience so that we can keep players. Okay? and doing the best of our ability to go through surveys and go through and talk to parents and meet with parents to understand you know, how we can not only increase the number of players but how we can retain the ones we have. And the things that come up are you know, how much time, how much money, you know, coaching, all these different things that we're trying to address on a daily basis. And you know, for me, if, if we have 60 
look around the room and, and see how many are in here. Now, I know a bunch of people have commitments, but that truly is my biggest challenge as a high school coach, is to get in front of a parent, which I would love to do. And because I don't think that Trent sending an email is as effective as Trent here talking to you. Okay? So I wish that were the case, but when I have these meetings, it's tough to get. Everybody's busy. I have six kids, too. I'm busy. But I also like having a great hockey program, so I have my six kids at home, and I'm here with you guys. Um, so all those things kind of transpire in the off season, and then I get an opportunity to digest and, and, and meet and, and kind of put a face to the name so that people understand. It's my preference, actually, that if you had a question and you wanted help in navigating hockey, yeah, you're a non-traditional hockey family, dad didn't play his whole life, and mom doesn't know about it, that you would reach out and say, hey, what is a camp or clinic I could do? Or, you know, what should I be doing my kids this age, right? That's the things that I proactively love to do to make sure that I can take those 60 kids and continue to build a great hockey program, right? Not so we win the state championship every year, not so we win every game, okay? The thing that gets forgotten when people talk about our hockey program, hey, did you guys win all 31 games? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. On that team, we had 11 National Honor Society kids. Okay. In the last three years, we've had 12 Division I scholarship kids. Okay. So those kids are taking care of school, taking care of academics. In the last four years, we have not had a single chemical violation, meaning we haven't lost a kid for chewing, smoking, drinking. Okay. That sounds like the kind of kids I want my own kids to hang out with. Okay. And you know, you can ask yourself kind of the chicken or the egg question. Why did, why, why does, what happened first? You have to be a good team. Okay, to beat good teams, or do you have to beat a good team to believe you're good, or, or how does that happen? Okay, and if you believe in the latter, that you know you're going to put it in the fate of luck. That well, if we beat a good team, that'll mean we're good. Right? You need to do the right things at all levels for your kids to believe they can compete. Right? So I encourage our youth programs to go out and schedule some of the same teams that we'll play at the high school level. Go play Edina. Go play Minnetonka. Go play play Wyzetta. Play Eden Prairie. Okay, and. There go those 57 squirts or 64 and go compete against those 240. It doesn't always go well, right? So that's a number that I have to pay attention to. And I ask these guys to pay attention to. And what can we do differently or better, okay, for our kids to enjoy the experience just as much as the other ones, okay? From paying attention to coaches or camps and clinics or keeping a certain level of excitement in our program or having a meeting when no one wants to meet, okay? Because if you think this meeting is going on all over the state with other high school coaches. It's not. It's not. I pay way more attention than most do. Okay? Most of them get what they get at the high school level and they go out and throw the puck out and play. And, and I don't want that. Okay? Because for me, you know, if I have a passion for the game, I love to go watch baseball or football, but hockey is my passion. So I want the kids to truly enjoy it. And if they leave the program, whether they played on the A, B, or C team, I want them to be super proud that they are part of the North Hockey Program. I want it to be special. I want it to be a program that when people look at it, they go, God, I see those guys in the red jerseys are good. I know they work really hard. And, and those are some of the things that we talk about at the high school level that I think is critical. And I want parents to have a clear understanding of. Because there's challenges that come in sports. Okay? The trial process in sports is never going to be perfect. Okay? And when I'm in charge of the trial process, do I feel fortunate that I have a hand in doing what I think is best? Yes. Do I also know that I'll have 20 parent meetings every year around the second week in October? Yeah. Yeah. Where I'll tell, you know, I'll be told that you made a mistake, this is this, that my kids way better than this. I understand that comes with sports, right? But those 20 parents aren't going to deter me from what I'm trying to do with the hockey program because I think it's it's worth that. Okay? Um, and that challenge along with how do how does Trent, Trent's impression of what's important, how does that work in your house? How do you value winning versus competing? Okay? And the idea that you know, society as a whole is far more liberal. Okay? Your kids and my kids get participation trophies, which I never got. Okay? The team that won got the trophy, and everyone else kicked the dirt and said, we're going to win the trophy next year. Right? Um, and for those 57 kids, how do we, how do we push them to pursue that. And what's right or what's wrong? It's not for me to say, but I know that that's what I'm up against when I'm dealing with a hundred and some families. Okay? What's important to Johnny and Jimmy or this side or the other? Okay? 
And for me to communicate that clearly and to get feedback from you guys is super important, okay? At the high school level, you know, we tell our kids, it's faith, family, and education. Whatever order you want to put those in, those things are more important than hockey, okay? After that, we hope hockey is number four. We hope it's a priority, okay? Um, we hope they make it a priority. We hope it forces them to balance their social schedule. We hope it forces them to make good decisions in social settings, not bad decisions. We hope it has a lot of positive impacts on their life. And I think right now you could argue that our program has done that at the high school level. And I'm attempting to assure that that continues to happen for our kids because the experiences they're having of going 31-0, and 0, winning a state championship, playing a hockey day, Okay? Whether it was our players, our coaches, our student managers, all these kids came up through LHA and played hockey. Okay? And some of them are managers, some of them will go on to be great youth coaches. All the referees that referee my games played youth hockey. Okay? Not everyone's going to be a pro or play on an 18 or even a high school varsity team. But if we pour some passion into our hockey association and hold ourselves accountable for the behavior of our players and our parents, um, we can do that. We can continue to have that success. Um, but that doesn't happen, you know, just by mistake, okay? And I told the last group, and I'll tell you guys, um, I don't think any of us push our kids out of the house and tell them, you know, go to school today and get some average grades. I really want you to have an average day. Right? Man, you were average. That was, that was really average, okay? And why should that not pertain to something that they're passionate about or something I'm passionate about? Okay? Because I think largely, you know, the words related to average are mediocre, middle of the row, which are things I don't think any of us aspire for our children to be or do. Okay? Not that every kid's going to be a straight A student and this instead of the other, but we push them to do that. And I think that the positives that come with that far outweigh the negatives of, of competing and taking a risk and losing. And so we'll continue to push that, that message. Um, understanding that we're, we're dealing with a hundred and you know some families but with that being the case that's why I think it's important to me and, and kind of help understand where we're at as an association and how we can continue to to make our association better by asking kids to compete by asking parents to understand and commit by taking feedback from parents on how many nights a week is too many at the rink how many games is too many to play you know, and our responsibility to the parents to, to keep the cost down. Oh, this tournament's only $300, let's get in it. Well, it's in Duluth. That costs a 1000 bucks for that family to get there and feed their other two kids. You know, and all those different things that we're weighing in the equation. Um, at the same time, asking our kids to, 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 you know, to compete hard and our parents to, to want their kids to go out there and compete. How do we push that and what's the right message? Um, and not allowing ourselves to just be another hockey association. Because okay? that's easy to do. If that was the case, I'd probably be watching you know, the NHL playoffs tonight. And you guys would be watching The Voice or whatever and wouldn't be here. But I take the time because I truly care. And I think if you um, had been in the locker room of the team or met the kids that went 31-0, and 0, it's priceless what they did. Okay. Um, teams that had, those kids that have competed and learned to balance the National Honor Society playing varsity hockey and baseball, that's priceless, okay? And so for me to stand up here and say that it's not important to have teams, youth teams that compete hard and, oh my God, actually win every now and then, would be a lie because I think it's a wonderful thing to learn, okay? Because you're going to go at some point, push these kids out the door and they're going to go succeed or fail in college, they're going to get a job interview, okay? And they're going to learn those things. And sports is a great tool to learn those things, okay? Study hard, get an A. Don't study, get a C. Life lesson, what do you want to do? Prepare for an interview, okay? Get the job, don't prepare, don't get it, okay? I mean, I'm raising six kids just like you guys. So if they happen to be passionate about hockey, and I know it's a huge commitment of parents, so largely people that are in hockey are, are committed to it because it's expensive, the rinks are cold, your practice times suck, okay? There's a lot of reasons not to play hockey. So people who do actually love it. And so if they're going to pour that passion into it, then I'm going to build a program that they can be proud of and that, that largely is successful. And whether you like it or not, you know, success in sports is largely um, 
viewed in wins and losses and success. And that's part of the equation. So with that, my next role is, is in the trial process, the dreaded trial process, okay? And understanding that there will never be a perfect trial process, meaning six sessions is enough, six sessions isn't enough, okay? You, you put too much emphasis on skills and not enough on scrimmage. Well, all you do is scrimmage. My kid's a really good skater, but he gets nervous, okay? I know there will never be a perfect process, and trust me, I don't lose sleep over it, okay? Because I'll never figure out the proper one, okay? What we do through the process is try to create likability groups, meaning we can continue to have kids develop in a situation that they're comfortable in. No different than reading or math, okay? You don't take a kid who struggles in reading, put him in the best group and tell him, go read in front of 300 kids. You put him in a situation where he's comfortable and he can grow and grow and grow and get confident. And that's all we do when we're evaluating hockey teams okay, in the winter. Okay? The five evaluators that I bring in have all played college hockey, but none of them live in Lakeville. Okay? So you have to understand how challenging it is. Right? The guy gets a clipboard and all of a sudden here comes a penny, you know, a number by skaters with pennies on. All he sees is numbers. Right? And in a matter of what, six hours, he's supposed to figure out where that kid fits in. So we're gonna make mistakes all the time, but by, by and large, we're gonna get it right. Okay? For the majority of the kids are gonna end up in a situation that's conducive. Okay? And with that, I think it's important to understand that. We use feedback from parents to try and create a process that we think works for everybody, okay? And if any one guy had all the power, myself included, I don't think that would be helpful. Although, although at times I think, I've, I've had these kids on the ice 300 times. I should just pick the teams, right? Because I know which kid's going to get hurt eight times in a season. I know which kid's going to miss practice. I know which kid's going to, you know, throw a temper tantrum. But that's good. Right? It's a good understanding to have, but I let the scores play out and those are the teams. Okay? But one thing that's, you know, over my five years I've found interesting is there are situations that arise all the time. Okay? And let's say this is now a BAM, a second year BAM. I've had him five years in the summer, five years in the spring, five years in the fall. I watched him play in the winter and he scores out on a team, whether that's a B or a double A team, and I go, that's going to go bad. Okay? And generally, I found I'm right. Okay? For reasons other than the hockey ability, okay? Because the top teams usually attract very competitive kids and parents. And when we get a non-competitive kid in there, it's a tough fit for him. The same thing has happened the other way, okay? A kid has a bad trial, he's sick, he's a, definitely a double-A player and he ends up on a B team, okay? He's clearly the best kid and you know what happens? His motivation goes out the door. His work ethic goes out the door, okay? So, if you don't think the fit's important, then it, you're wrong. You're wrong because it, it, it really ends up being important. And so pushing kids to compete is a good thing. And we try our best to get those things right, but ultimately it, it'll never be a perfect process. Um, I think that, you know, in, in terms of trying to mold the, the, the association or trying to build a culture around this association or a business or whatever that is, it's, it ends up, in my estimation, always being a product of the people that are in it, you know, and how they carry themselves and what they believe, you know. I don't think it ends up being by dumb luck that, you know, Edina's hockey program is good or Eden Prairie's football program is really good or, you know, Egan's debate program is really good. I think when you peel back the onion a little bit, you'll either find, you know, some of the people in charge are really passionate, really good at what they do, really care about what they do. So it's not dumb luck. It ends up being people super motivated to have exactly what they have, a great program. Whether that's a speech program, a marching band, a football program. It ends up not being luck. It's exactly what it is. So I pour myself into this thing for a reason and surround myself with guys that are passionate about hockey for a reason so that kids can have a great experience. Um, and meetings like this are, you know, my way of conveying that message to, you know, as many people as I can. And it's a way of helping parents and kids understand that, you know, my job is to help you get to be the best you can, okay? But you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make them drink, okay? And I want kids to have a path to succeed in something they're passionate about. But if they never take me up on it, I wish I could help them out, right? 
And I wish I could change the fact that everybody wants to play on the double-A team. But it doesn't happen. Fifteen do. And everybody wants to play on the varsity team. And i got to cut 30 kids every year. I'd rather them know in squirts and peewees and bands and as they come up through our program that it's very competitive. It's extremely competitive. So that they have the opportunity during that time to work and improve if they so decide rather than them not have any idea and run into a brick wall when they get to my program. So, like I said, this is my opportunity to share that with you, um, to kind of continue to guide the program the, the best way I can, to allow these guys to share information with you, to be accessible um, through tech camps and clinics and, and programs and everything that we can do to be a part of it, put great coaches on the ice. Um, and understand that that my message will always be that you know that room full or shelf full of participation trophies after a while won't mean anything to you. You didn't do anything to get them. You didn't have to work to earn them, other than sign up for baseball or track. You got a trophy, and I largely disagree with that. Not that I'm I'm, I'm right, but uh, you know, like I said, I think that. Um, Society's view on things has become far more liberal, and those my kids get those trophies that I never got. I never understood it. You know, you lost by ten runs. Why did they give you a trophy? I don't know. Whatever. But not whether I'm right or wrong. But I want the kids to have a great experience. But I do want them to value competing. I really do. I want our teams to compete hard. It doesn't always mean you're going to win, and that that at times is irrelevant to me. But I want kids to have the best opportunity to succeed in our program um, and, and the parents to understand that I'm accessible to help them do that. And, and if not, if not, that's okay. Uh, with that, any questions, comments we can help you with? I think all the information, at a minimum, will be on the website for the summer program because I just sent it again to Coach Connick. Um, but I've coached most of your kids before in some form or fashion in the spring or fall clinic or whatever. And uh, just know that you can always call me if you have questions, um, comments that you think can help the program. And I will tell you this, uh, and Coach Connick didn't say this, but we do struggle to find coaches all the time. We look hard to find the best ones um, and understand the challenges. But uh, the last group got the answer. For all the coaches that I've talked to to try to find great youth coaches, you know the number one reason that these guys won't coach? Can anyone tell me? Parents. parents. <laughs> they don't want to deal with parents. Okay. So I'm not discovering anything new or telling you guys anything new, but the landscape of sports has changed. You know, and I tell our high school parents that, in my mind, they are fans. They're there to support their children. Know, and if they wanted to be a coach, they should have applied for the job. Um, but they didn't. You know, and I think that's important that the culture um, is the same all throughout LHA. And understand that that, although we kind of chuckle at it, is a sad comment. That a lot of good people I know, a lot of really good hockey people that would love to coach, will not coach because they will not be able to parents. So, um, kind of the practice what you preach campaign. It's hard for us to tell our kids to go out there and work hard, be a good sport, and then five minutes later get your popcorn and be in the stands yelling at some referee or coach. Okay? But that's largely what goes on. Just call them space baby. Ah yeah, good point. Okay, so I must have scrolled close by that. Um, one thing that's important for you guys to understand, okay? And it puts a coach with a parent in kind of in a juxtaposition right off the hop. And especially for me in my role, okay? When I view the, the association or, or my view on things always has to be the program, the team, and then the individual, okay? And I largely understand that I'm dealing with parents who have that order reversed. The most important thing to them is their child, right? Then the team, then the program, okay? So... I say that only because I've, I've, I've had, I don't know, hundreds and hundreds of parent meetings, both positive and negative, not always, you know, that I'm a jerk or I made a bad decision about their kid, but um, in those meetings, I will tell you this, um, and I, I guess you could maybe include myself in this, that it is very, very rare 
to find a parent who is honestly objective about his son or daughter in sports. Very rare. Okay. And I don't say that in a demeaning way, right? They're your children or my children. It's hard to be objective. You always think little Johnny or Susie's better than they are or they deserve a better opportunity and I understand that. But that's a, a, a challenging thing for a coach and a person in my position sometimes is that you know, my responsibility is exactly the reverse of the parent. Is that my responsibility is first to the program, then to the team, then to the individual. And it always has to be that way. I have to make decisions that are best for the program, always. Not best for Trent or Ryan or little Johnny or you know, Mr. Jones or anyone. And then the team and then the individual. And I fully understand that every parent has a passion for their child. And sometimes those things are reversed. So um, just know that moving forward that when we do things and try to make decisions, it's with the program in mind first, always. Anything else I missed? Questions? <coughs> what are some of the things that you guys are doing from a leadership level perspective to try to grow? Especially at like the mic level and yeah. going up. Well, you know, what are some of the initiatives that, that are the, happening to try to increase? The question was in regards to trying to grow our numbers. Um, and given that, you know, if Lakeville was one hockey association, our numbers would be good, not great, you know, not overwhelmingly great um, based on the size of the city. Uh, but, you know, the constant initiatives are things that, you know, they seem like they're a good idea, but they end up really not being. It's, it's the free hockey stuff, and, and largely, you know, what we found out over the years is that um, everyone takes you up on the free part of it, but the the level of retention we get from those people is almost zero. So you're spending a lot of money to give people free hockey that aren't ultimately becoming a long-term part of the program. So um, you can't blame them for doing it. Maybe free hockey is a good deal, but um, that's a tough nut to crack. I think the bigger and better way to to uh, to at least maintain the numbers and grow them is to keep the cost under control. And we do that by obviously things like combined ice, team sizes, um, you know, limiting game schedules and tournament schedules and actually adhering to those limits that we have, um, which keeps the cost, you know, under control. It's never going to be an inexpensive sport, um, but there are ways. Um, when, you, when you have really small teams and then you start to spread out the cost among the family, it can easily go from, you know, a $1,300 a year deal to 2200 bucks, which is, which is tough. Uh, it's a tough game to grow in that sense. Um, but I think that's the one thing that, you know, we're trying to really pay attention to this year is practice to game ratios and how that, those team sizes and those, um, those tournaments and, and things, you know, there's no such thing as a free tournament when they put you in it, right? It's in blue, they're more heads, it's not free. Um, those things to keep the cost down. But like I said, we're always open for ideas. We're struggling right now to get goalies in, in the north side. Uh, it's just unbelievable. You know, I have two in my family and I think I have half the goalies. <laughs> um, to be honest, seriously. And, and we've tried to be creative there too, you know. Just because you give someone free equipment doesn't mean they're going to play, but you have to try it. Uh, so the part about growing the numbers, I just think if you can get a kid to, to squirt hockey, if you can get him through lights to squirts, you got it. I mean, I think we'd all agree it's an addictive sport. If you're going to get up at 6 in the morning and grab a shag or whatever, you're, you're either addicted or committed. So it's a great sport to be a part of. But um, it's, it is the non-traditional hockey families can you know, play basketball and other things for a fraction of the price. So, but you got to get them to try before you're ever going to get them hooked. I would encourage you to tell a neighbor. I could start bringing onesies with the North logo to the hospitals. So I thought about that. I don't sew, though. Someone can help me. Well, if
that's it. If anyone has any other questions, um, you can ask me after or whatever. But I do appreciate the time, and please do share um, if you thought it was at all worthwhile the message with other people, or encourage them to either watch it online. Um, but like I said, we want we want the the experience at North Hockey to be a great one, and it takes a lot of people to achieve that. Parents, coaches, kids, everybody. So thank you for your time. Post it on the, the LHA website, right? Marcus, yeah. Yes. Yeah. And Tom's here yeah. too. Okay. And then, like I said, questions about I, the worst thing for me is when someone tells me, "Oh, I didn't know about your clinic. I didn't know where I would have been in it." You know. There's my email, and and the summer stuff will be on the website tomorrow or whatever. But if you have any questions ever, okay, um, I would I would be glad to help you. Thank you guys. Thank you.